Yeah, we'll, we'll have to troubleshoot it uh, later. Do you like to work with metal, fire, electricity? Would you like to make money doing it? At Southwestern, we can help make your dream a reality. With our degree and certificate programs in welding, you'll be prepared for a career in the welding and fabrication industry in as little as a year. Check out our website and let Southwestern spark your career in welding today. Southwestern Oregon Community College gave me the opportunity for a new career doing something I love. I'm Amber Yardley, and three years ago, I knew I needed to make a career change for myself and my family. With the support of staff, my academic advisor, and the instructors at SWAC, I now have a dream job and the confidence to continue my education. Contact Southwestern Oregon Community College and start the journey to your new career today. This is Southwestern's dental assisting program. In just one short year, you could be a dental assistant. Sign up now for your one-year dental assisting certification. Congratulations, you just got accepted into college. Now, how do you pay for it? Fortunately, there are several options out there to consider. Follow this simple step-by-step -step guide as you figure out how to pay for college. Step one, fill out your FAFSA. Ah, free application for federal student aid, FAFSA. Your FAFSA will determine if you qualify for financial aid including grants, some scholarships, work study, and federal student loans. The good news is most people qualify for some financial aid, which is why this is the most important step in figuring out how to pay for college. Step two, figure out how much you may need to borrow by weighing your college costs versus your contributions, including any grants or scholarships. Some easy arithmetic will make your math teachers proud. Let's say your college of choice costs $30,000 a year after factoring in tuition, housing, books, lab fees, and a laptop. Now, let's pretend that the money found in your family swear jar, your bowling scholarship, your federal grant, and the money you saved as a scuba instructor contributes $10,000 to your college fund. Voila! This is how much you will need to cover through other means. Many families consider student loans a reliable option. Step 3. There are two categories of student loans you can consider, federal and private. Federal loans are made by the government and private loans are made by private lenders. In some cases, families use both to cover the cost of college. Compare student loan options by looking at their interest rates, repayment options, and fees. Interest rates vary depending on the loan type. Federal loan rates are fixed, while private loan rates can be fixed or variable and are determined by your credit quality. Adding a cosigner, like mom and dad, may help lower your interest rate. 
Repayment options for federal and private loans are also different. Some providers require in-school payments, some don't. Take a look at these now and choose an option that makes sense for you. Watch out for fees. Fees can be charged upfront or in repayment, and they add to the total cost of the loan so you end up paying more back. Step four, factor in other benefits when researching a loan. Some reduce your interest rate and some give you cash back. For example, Discover student loans have no fees and give you a cash reward for a 3.0 GPA or equivalent. Let's go through these steps one more time, just in case you needed a refresher. Step one, fill out your FAFSA. Step two, weigh your school cost versus your contributions. Maximize any free money like personal savings, grants, and scholarships before considering loans. Step three, compare interest rates, repayment options, and fees. Step four, take into account any benefits the loan provider may offer. Don't forget that you can continue to reduce the amount you need to borrow with scholarships. If you are an eligible current or college-bound student, you can enter to win a $2,500 Discover Student Loan Scholarship Award. Head over to collegecover.com to learn more about paying for college and enter to win. No purchase or loan required. So first, first and foremost, thank you all for coming out tonight. Sorry for the delays. You can never get enough technical delays. I love technology except for when it doesn't work. Uh, thank you to whoever brought the maps out. Fantastic. If you haven't signed one of these great sign-in sheets, if you take a moment on your way out tonight to do that, uh, it helps justify this. It also lets me see where folks are coming from uh, around the area as well. And we've got this handy dandy little sheet for your refrigerator or wherever that shows that the first three talks this year are all earthquake centric. So if you like earthquakes, we have October, November, and the annual Cascadia anniversary event. So grab one of those, take one for a friend as long as they're there. So. This evening's speaker, Dr. Susan Huff, comes to us f as an IRIS SSA distinguished speaker. And for over 15 years, and she's probably about the 15th IRIS speaker that's come here, uh, they send folks out to talk about seismic activity around the country. So Susan and Artie, our November speaker, and Sarah, our January speaker, all were part of a four IRIS speaker group down in San Francisco last night at the Exploratorium. Uh, so probably the only difference is that we have them spread out over time and we don't allow you to bring beer and wine in here, uh, which that's not gonna happen anytime soon. Uh, so it's really my pleasure to have Susan as well as the other IRIS speakers because their key goal is communicating about complicated information in a really approachable way, and I think that's integral. If you haven't gotten enough science after tonight, if you're not doing anything tomorrow from six to eight-ish, uh, there's an offshore wind energy thing. Uh, 
check that out outside. There's some posters out there unless they have disappeared. But the key here is that it's folks from a whole bunch of different backgrounds, and that was the piece that intrigued me. Uh, I get to try and make sure that everybody stays within their allotted time limit, so uh, that's going to be my job tomorrow uh, as well as introducing them. But we've got folks that are coming down to talk about renewables, about sustainability, mm -hmm. about STEM in the sense of engineering and construction. Uh, we're talking about community and community engagement, uh, also infrastructure, and also economics. So it has the opportunity to be a, a really broad-based uh, based set of talks tomorrow night. Again, it starts at 6 o'clock. If you're doing uh, other things already on the books, uh, it'll also be live streamed and archived as well. Uh, and also, if you have places to put posters, there's some posters for the November talk by Artie Rogers, who's also another Irish speaker. Please take some, distribute them all, all around to any place that uh, you might go to. Uh, you as minions posting those makes my life a lot, lot easier. So without further ado, since we're already a dude, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you straight out of politics, facts and fake facts about earthquakes with Dr. Susan Huff from the USGS. Thank you. So yeah, um, thank you to Ron and to the other folks here at the college for hosting this talk and to Ron for the, for the work that he's done to, to run this, um, this amazing series. It's great to be here. I was in San Francisco just last night and San Francisco is a great city, but after that, Coos Bay is a breath of fresh air, let me tell you. Yes. Man, San Francisco is loud. Um, so yeah, I'm here, uh, I'm brought to you by um, a couple of, oh, I'm not toggled, okay. I've got to toggle the screen so you can see what I can see. That would be good. Um, and I'm sorry? I'm just going to use the remote. OK, but the screen should be mirrored. OK, let me up. Ah, there we go. OK, but it's, there we go. OK. But am I using the computer up there or this one? Up here. OK. So yeah, uh, the sponsors of, of the lecture series, starting with NSF, but uh, IRIS, the Incorporated Research Institutes for Seismology, really does the heavy lifting with the program. Um, also, the Seismological Society of America. And then I, I work for the US Geological Survey. So they've helped, uh, helped this talk come together. I have to start with a little bit of an apology or at least an explanation that usually when I give this talk, I try to tailor it as much as I can to the local audience and the, the issues that you're concerned about. And um, I knew 2019 was going to be a busy year when it started. Um, I did not know that Southern California was going to be hit by the largest earthquake in 20 years. Uh, when the Ridgecrest earthquake struck, uh, on the morning of July 4th, just because life wasn't fun enough uh, up in the high desert. And one of the hats that I wear at the moment is I'm the Southern Cal the Pasadena USGS Earthquake Response Coordinator. So I was on the hot seat to, to do the coordination. And then, because life wasn't fun enough, um, let's see, is this going to advance? About 30 hours later, an even bigger earthquake struck, a magnitude 7.1. So these earthquakes did happen in the high desert. Fortunately, they were, well, they were close to the towns of Ridgecrest and Trona. They were fortunately away from larger population centers. So this shows the maps of the fault breaks that were uh, mapped out over time by the, geolo the geologists who were out there. Um, so the impact of these earthquakes wasn't as bad as it might have been because of the location. But uh, scientifically, they're, they're very interesting, they're very important, and the response has been very, very time consuming. So, uh, that said, I, I have tailored the talk a little bit to, to talk about the, the issues close to home, but we're going to have some geographical diversity um, to, to the talk tonight. And first I have to figure out how to get the slides to advance. Okay, so here we are, um, and we're going to talk about facts and fake facts, and, and to make things interesting, um, we're going to play a game of Mythbusters, and I'm going to join it, and that's me when my hair was a little less um, 
electric. But what I'm going to do is show you a series of statements. And I want you to think in your mind um, whether you think each one is a fact, or true, or a fake fact, a myth. And just keep a running tally in your mind. It's Everything's made up and the points don't matter. OK, so fact or fake fact? And I, I warned you that there's going to be some geographical diversity here. So the 18, the first statement is that church bells rang in Boston during the 1811-1812 New Madrid earthquakes. So that was in the central US back then. Fact or fake fact? And I'm not answering, asking for answers, just to think. Um, the 1811-1812 sequence included the largest earthquakes ever witnessed uh, by people who kept written records in the contiguous 48 United States. There's a lot in that, but um, OK, three. It's impossible to know the magnitude of an earthquake that happened before the invention of seismometers. Fact or fake fact? Four. Recent moderate earthquakes in the central United States have been caused by hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Five, the advent, okay, the advent of widespread unconventional oil recovery techniques is responsible for the increase in earthquake activity in the heartland. And that sounds a lot like the last one, but it is worded differently. So I'll let you make a decision on that. Six, with the increase in induced earthquakes, in the central US, seismic hazard in Oklahoma is as high as it is in the western states. Fact or fake fact? And then lastly, the one you really care about, the next big one is overdue in the Pacific Northwest. Fact or fake fact? And some of these aren't really facts at all. They're, they're kind of statements upon which, on, on which someone could have an opinion. But let's just talk about them. So yeah, we are here. Um, and I suspect from the fact that you turned out on a Friday night after it has been that kind of week for a lot of us, um, you know, you, you, we are sitting here along this ribbon of very high hazard that runs along the western state. So earthquakes are um, a concern for pretty much certainly everyone in the west and in other, some other parts of the United States. So this is a hazard map for the U.S. Okay, so let's talk about this one. Church bells rang in Boston during the 1811-1812 New Madrid earthquakes. Um, you hear it a lot. So the 18, in 1811-1812, from December 16th to February 7th, there was a pretty remarkable series of earthquakes that was witnessed by people who kept written records. But it was early in American history, so the records that we have are pretty fragmentary. Uh, by, there were either three or four significant earthquakes during that sequence, depending on how you count. But we now think that there's two main fault zones. So this is the Boot Hill of Missouri, this is, which is down here. You can see the background seismicity that's still popping off. We think there were two faults that were, two main faults that were involved in the sequence uh, with, um, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So um, if you read the Boston newspapers, you will not find any mention that any of these earthquakes were even felt in Boston. They did talk about the earthquakes happening in other places, but nobody said, and we felt the earthquakes here. So the reasonable inference is that the earthquakes were not even felt as far north as Boston. Uh, so, but this, this is a myth. Um, it's a fake fact that sort of refuses to die. And I, I come up with a theory for where it came from. Um, the largest of the earthquakes on February 7, 1812, did cause the church bells to ring at St. Ste Philip's Steeple in Charleston, South Carolina, which is still standing. And my theory is that at some point along the way, Charleston turned into Charlestown, turned into Boston. But if you remember nothing else from this talk, please, please, please remember that church bells did not ring in Boston during the 1811-1812 New Madrid earthquakes, even if you read otherwise on websites that are put out there by the US Geological Survey. OK, busted. So the, the New Madrid earthquakes were the largest earthquakes uh, in the contiguous US. I should say the largest earthquake for which we have a known date, because going back in prehistoric time, who knows what's happened. 
Um, so our estimate of size, how big were these earthquakes? We, don't, we didn't have seismometers back then, but we do have maps of how the earthquakes were felt and the kind of damage that they generated. Going back to seminal work by Otto Nutley in 1973, and there were maps like this showing that the earthquakes were felt um, all the way into New England, although not actually to, to Boston. Oops, I shouldn't wander too far from this. Um, but it turns out, well, so these maps are based on what we call intensity. So magnitude is how big the earthquake was, and that there's one number for one earthquake. Intensity says what's the severity of shaking at any location. And the scales overlap in range, so it sometimes confuses people. But intensities range from 1, which is not felt, all the way up to 10, which is catastrophic, as bad as it gets shaking. Um, and it's, it's a measure that we still use. If you've ever gone to the USGS, did you feel it site? Um, you can fill out a questionnaire and it will build up essentially an intensity map like this one. This is for the 2011 Mineral Virginia earthquake, which is actually the earthquake that was felt by more Americans than any earthquake in, in history. So, okay, that's intensities. But if you're looking at a historic earthquake, we didn't have, did you feel it? We have to go back to archival sources to see what people wrote down for earthquakes um, back in the, the 19th century. And for example, this is an account of one of the New Madrid earthquakes in Cincinnati. It was violent. The loose furniture of the rooms was agitated. Doors, uh, it opened partition doors. It threw off the top of a few chimneys in town. And that's pretty intense shaking. And that suggests a oops, intensity on the order of six to seven, so a pretty healthy level of shaking. But it turns out that this isn't the full quote. And uh, one day I went to the Library of Congress in DC and I found the full quote, which continues, it seems to have been stronger in the valley of the Ohio River than in the adjoining uplands. Many families living on the elevated ridges of Kentucky, not more than 20 miles from the river, slept during the shock. So what this is describing is shaking that's stronger along the river valleys, where we know we have loose sediments that tend to amplify shaking. But as soon as you got away from the river valleys, the shaking wasn't that strong. And so this whole account away from the river valleys suggests more like intensity four. So um, this is work that I've been doing going back to the late 90s. But from this map that was drawn, it was a pretty good first order compilation. Um, but it didn't take into account two things. One is that um, at the time, 1811, 1812, people were living along the waterways. So most of where people, most of the locations where we have accounts were where the shaking was amplified because it was along the rivers. And you have to take that into account. Also, there's a fundamental reporting bias that any time an earthquake happens, even today, what you see in the news is pictures of dramatic damage. I mean, it happened in the 2015 Nepal earthquake. If you think about the images you saw from that earthquake, you saw collapsed temples. Well, I flew into Kathmandu about a month after that earthquake. And in Kathmandu Valley, overwhelmingly, you wouldn't have known an earthquake had happened. The damage was so light. There were other places that were hard hit. But the nature of the media and archival sources is that it focuses in on the most spectacular damage, not necessarily the representative damage. So if you unpack all of that for New Madrid, uh, this, these big balloon contours, oops, I'm not sure this guy is working. The big balloon contours sort of change into a, a less ferocious map, and um, the earthquakes don't look quite as, as big as, as were once estimated. So the magnitudes for these earthquakes were estimated at one point as high as eight and three quarters, which was enormous. Uh, but the modern estimates are closer to magnitude 7. So, okay. So the biggest earthquake in the contiguous U.S. for which a, a precise date is known is, is the one that happened here on, on um, January, the night of January 26, 1700. Uh, and you, I, I assume you, you know the story. The date was pinpointed from the tsunami records in Japan, and then some um, fabulous work by Kenji Zataki, Kenji Zataki uh, Brian Atwater, and others. So that, that earthquake was um, 
was far bigger than New Madrid, so this one is also uh, busted. So, okay, it's, I've already talked about this one a little bit. Uh, it's impossible to know the magnitude of an earthquake that occurred before the invention of seismometers. We can't estimate magnitudes as precisely without seismometers, but we can estimate magnitudes for older earthquakes. And I've already uh, given a, a preview of this. Um, but there's a couple of ways you can estimate magnitudes. If you have uh, ghost forests, where forests were either submerged, well, generally submerged, so the trees were killed, um, you can get a, a measure of where the ground went up and down. From tree rings, sometimes right along a fault, you can see evidence for growth disruptions. Uh, Paleoliquefaction, I'll talk about that. And then looking at older fault, fault scarps, if you can actually see the break, you can get a, a measure of how big the earthquake was. Uh, for a lot of earthquakes, we rely on these intensities. So what damage did the earthquake cause? Uh, where was it felt and so forth? And we compare these maps to the shaking from earthquakes that have happened in recent times as calibration. And so we get the magnitudes that way. So, um, oh yeah, and the paleo liquefaction in the central US, the 1811-1812 earthquakes caused enormous liquefaction. So sand layers at depth were shaken so hard that they were vented to the surface to create these sand blows. And you can still see them. If you drive around the Boot Hill area uh, when, the crops, uh, when the crops are in, you can see blighted patches because the, the crops don't grow as well on these big patches of sandy soil. And then if, if the fields are bare, you can see them uh, on the upper left, just these, these blotches of sand. So you can use the distribution of liquefaction and you can estimate magnitude. Um, you can also, by digging back, and this is largely work by Marticia Tuttle and her colleagues, if you can identify prehistoric sand blows, you can build up a chronology of past earthquakes. Uh, so that's been done, and, and past earthquakes, prehistoric earthquakes have been identified. Um, so for Cascadia, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that from the fact that you've, you've turned out on a Friday night, you're, I'm, I'm assuming that you're... Um, that you're pretty savvy about, um, about earthquakes and that you've been to some of the earlier talks here and so that you've heard some of these stories before. But um, the magnitude has been estimated a couple of ways, one from tsunami modeling. So how big, a, how big a tsunami would it take to generate the tsunami that was observed in Japan? Um, and then we have these estimates of coastal uplift. And there was some debate over the years, but the estimate comes in uh, close to magnitude 9 for that earthquake. So a really great uh, earthquake. So yeah, this one is, is definitely busted. Um, now, that said, whoops, I'm having a hard time convincing this to advance when I wanted to. These historic earthquake magnitudes un are uncertain. Um, so we don't, we don't know them as precisely. But that magnitude 9, you know, plus or minus a little bit, it was still one enormous earthquake. Okay, so now let's shift gears and talk about man-made earthquakes, which have been in the news in some parts of the U.S. in recent years. And recent earthquakes in the central U.S. have been caused by fracking or hydraulic fracturing. And so fact or fake fact. So um, it's two, two plots on, on the slide. One is the, the easier one to see is uh, the, the bigger one, the, nu the number of earthquakes greater than magnitude 3 in the state of Oklahoma from 1979 through 2015. You can see how it was low, and then all of a sudden it took off. And then this is a map of the state of Oklahoma, if you can see it, and the red dots are the small earthquakes that have been recorded since 2009. So Oklahoma got to be a very earthquakey place starting around 2009. Um, and so... There was a debate for some years about whether or not these were man-made. It seemed pretty obvious to a lot of people, but then there was pushback. And one of the arguments is that, well, seismicity is always clustered. We always have active periods and less active periods. And there was a cluster back in the 50s, and this is just another cluster. And so one of the projects I did with my colleague Morgan Page is look back at the earthquakes through the 20th century. And the, the first thing, so this is now expanding that timeline all the way back to 1900, because we know something about the earthquakes that have happened in earlier decades. 
And, and it sort of jumps off the page that, yeah, there was a cluster of activity in the 1950s, but what's happened since 2009 blows that out of the water. So this is not just another cluster. That's one, one point. The other point is this is a whole other talk altogether, but if you dig back, there's compelling evidence that that cluster in the 50s, they were induced too. So those weren't natural earthquakes. So, uh, let's see. so what about fracking? I mean, that was fracking, hydraulic fracturing really got going, and so that it was sort of seemed pretty clear that that's why the earthquakes um, were had picked up at such a dramatic rate. It turns out that that hydraulic fracturing involves drilling these directional wells, injecting fluid into the crust, and breaking up the rock um, shale, oil shales to release hydrocarbons that are too tightly in the, the rock formation to be pumped conventionally. And so by breaking up the rock, that allows the, the oil to be produced. But the key for hydraulic fracturing is that these production formations are fairly shallow. And they're uh, well above the depths where natural earthquakes happen. Natural earthquakes happen down in what we call basement rock. The fracking is going on at, at shallow levels, and it does induce some earthquakes. Um, but a number of studies have shown that overwhelmingly fracking, per se, is not responsible for this, this big upsurge in, in the number of earthquakes. So this statement, as written, I'm going to say is busted. But now let's go on to the more carefully worded statement um, that the advent of fracking is responsible for many recent earthquakes in the heartland. And you're thinking, OK, what the fuck? Um, did, didn't we just talk about this, right? Um, well, it turns out it is carefully worded for a reason, um, because hydraulic fracturing has indirectly led to the, the, the uh, increase in earthquake activity. And the point is, the, the, is that that this process involves injecting water into the crust to break up the rock, and then, um, then the oil is, is produced. And it turns out that, um, I think I have to point it that way and look that way. That's my coordination challenge for the evening. So it turns out that wastewater, or what they call salt water, is, has always been part of oil production, even primary oil production back in the, way, back in the day. There's always a small amount of co-produced water. It tends to be very salty. It tends to be laced with, with unfriendly chemicals. And you have to do something with it. So what do you do with it? Um, back in the day, sometimes water was dumped into storm drains. Uh, sometimes they disposed of it in what they called open pits, you know, literally big pits. Um, that led to some unpleasantries like dead cows and lawsuits. Um, so in the back in the 50s, they moved to wastewater disposal in deep injection wells. So you take this water that's full of salt, it's full of chemicals, and you cart it to a deep well, class, class uh, one or class two injection well, and you or class one, I, yeah, sorry, class one, you inject the wastewater deep in the crust. And it's got to be deep because you've got it. You don't want to have contamination of, of groundwater. And that turns out to be the bad actor for earthquakes because you're injecting that fluid deep in the crust, getting close to the basement rock where earthquakes do happen, and increasing the fluid pressure. So if you think about a soda can, if you shake it up, right, you haven't even you're increasing the pressure in that can, and you open it, and, and bad things happen. So it's, it's the same thing that's going on at depth. There's the fluid itself, but you're, you're raising the pressure, and that can cause earthquakes. So this statement, as written, this one is, is confirmed. It is, it's hydraulic fracturing indirectly that's, that's been causing overwhelmingly these, these earthquakes. OK, so with the increase in induced earthquakes, seismic hazard is in Oklahoma is, 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 is comparable to hazard in the western United States. Uh, you may have seen, if you've been following any of this, you may have seen some figures that suggest that this statement is true. This, was produced, this map was from the USGS a couple years ago. It shows the number of magnitude three or greater earthquakes in California um, versus 
Oklahoma, and Oklahoma started to go up. And by chance, in 2014, Oklahoma actually produced more magnitude 3 or greater earthquakes than California did. And early on when I showed this talk, someone said, is there a reason why California's plotted in blue and Oklahoma's <laughs> plotted in red? And I hadn't noticed until then. I kind of suspect that maybe somebody did that on purpose. But um, Yeah, so Oklahoma, at least at one point, was producing a lot of magnitude 3 earthquakes. Um, and then there was another uh, map that was put out, well, another product that was put out. The USGS started to put out one-year forecasts, hazard forecasts, trying to assess the chances of damage. Uh, so in California, just over a year now, uh, com compared to the central U.S. and in Oklahoma, and all of a sudden Oklahoma looks redder than, than California, which is, is quite startling. But the thing is, they'd, for this map, they define damage as intensity 6. And intensity 6 will knock things off of your shelves. It might crack a very weak chimney, uh, but it's not really serious damage. So if you have a magnitude 4.5 or 5 that's very close to you, you could get up to intensity 6. And so that would count as damage. And so that's what this map is, is trying to forecast, is the chances of light damage, not the chances of significant damage caused by bigger earthquakes. If you look at the bigger earthquakes, so this is now a map of the US from 2009 to 2017, magnitude five and greater. And this is a different story. Now in that time, there were four induced earthquakes in Oklahoma greater than magnitude five. But then in the, the Virginia earthquake happened, that was a natural earthquake in the Eastern US. But then you can see what's going on in the Western states. So the bigger earthquakes that are really controlling serious hazards, um, the west, it, which is where you have earthquakes caused by the plates moving and active tectonic forces, is significantly more energetic, more hazardous than is the, the central US. So, um, oops. My problem here is that I need to turn this off. The <laughs> The talk is also let loaded on a computer, and I can advance those slides, but that has nothing to do with the slides that you're seeing. And I should know that by now. OK. With the, the seismic hazard in Oklahoma is comparable to hazard in California and the western states, no. There's a lot of earthquakes in Oklahoma. They've had to come to grips with that. They've actually taken regulatory steps to, con to um, to control the, the wastewater injection, and, and they have succeeded in, in scaling back the earthquake activity. But even at its worst, it wasn't comparable to the western states. So, um, oh, and by the way, um, there's kind of been this assumption that induced earthquakes are only an issue in the central US, and it's not something that happens in the west. Um, I don't think that's true if you look back, so more lessons from the past, if you look back at some of the earthquakes that happened in California, going back to the early 20th century, at that time, Los Angeles and some other areas were oil towns. And people may not realize it now, but Los Angeles at one point was one of the biggest oil producing regions in the country in the early 20th century. And some of the earthquakes that happened then, there's some pretty compelling evidence that they actually were induced as well. Uh, so here's a, I mean, this, this could be a whole nother talk, but I'm just going to show this one slide. There was a magnitude 5-ish near Whittier, so this is Southern California, the Los Angeles area on the left, which I would point to if the pointer would, would cooperate. Um, so magnitude 5-ish earthquake, the epicenter, as far as we can tell, was smack where the uh, active production was in the Santa Fe Springs oil field. And what's more, you can actually look back at the production totals. Oh, and it's, so the field was discovered, production ramps up. There was a three and a half earthquake earlier, just as production ramped up. The field starts to be depleted. They deepen the well, production ramps up, and the five happens right down. So you have the spatial and temporal association between especially deepening of wells and, uh, and production and then the earthquakes. So it's the... It's the opposite argument from, 
from wastewater injection. Wastewater injection, you're putting fluid into the crust and you're raising fluid pressure. With oil production, you're taking fluid out of the crust, so you're lowering fluid pressure, which is a good thing, but you also change the stress at depth, and it turns out in some cases that that can actually cause earthquakes as well. So the point here is that earthquakes in the West, in California and Oregon, overwhelmingly are caused by natural tectonic forces, but the West isn't somehow immune from induced earthquakes. Okay. So now let's, let's finally move on and talk about the possible big one in the Pacific Northwest. Is it overdue? Um, so you may, this is a fuzzy slide, unfortunately, uh, but it shows the timeline that's been pieced together of past or estimated past earthquakes uh, along the Cascadia subduction zone. This is work by Chris Goldfinger and others. Um, and you can see, so there's, there's quite a few earthquakes now going back thousands of years that we, that we know about. And this is mostly from uh, turbidites, from, uh, from sediment layers offshore where you can see, if you drill down, you can see where past earthquakes shook up. The sediments caused landslides, and, and those have been used to piece together this long chronology. Uh, for different parts of the Cascadia zone, there's different estimated recurrence times from here to Eureka. There's been a good size earthquake about every 230-ish years. From Coos Bay to Newport, it's more like 380 to 380 years. And then for the 1700 monster magnitude nines, those seem to happen about every 600 years. So you might look at some of these numbers and say, well, it's been 300 years. Maybe this area is overdue. Um, and it turns out that that word overdue pops up with uh, regarding a number of other fault zones in other areas, uh, one of which is the southern San Andreas. So this is a busy slide, but this is southern California, and there's map faults. In 1857, there was an earthquake along here, down towards San Bernardino. Um, then there were some other earthquakes that we've seen. But th so this part of the San Andreas hasn't gone since 1857. This part hasn't gone since we, the start of written records, so over 300 years. And there's been a tendency to also say, well, the, the southern San Andreas is overdue for a big earthquake. Um, and in fact, if you look at headlines, um, recent headlines, you find things like this, that um, you know, maybe the, the Ridgecrest earthquakes in the desert are gonna trigger a, a big major earthquake in California sometime in the next decade. And this has to do with the fact that this fault is overdue. But if you look back to 1992, uh, you find similar sounding stories. And so this was the Landers earthquake that happened in 1992, pretty close to the San Andreas. And if I, if I can read this, it would be easier if it was on my screen at this point. It said something like, uh, it's hard to read. It talks about how scientists have estimated the chances of a huge earthquake on the southern San Andreas at 60% in the next 30 years. That was starting in 1992. That was 27 years ago. 60%. And it says, but in, in interviews last week, most scientists said they expect it will happen much sooner. Quote, most of us have an awful feeling that 30 years is wishful thinking. So that's, we're looking at that fault thinking it's overdue. It's not, even, it's not gonna be 30 years from now, it's gonna be any day now. And in fact, you can go all the way back to 1925 when this ge gentleman, a renowned geologist, Bailey Willis, stepped forward and was predicting that Southern California was gonna be racked by a great earthquake in no more than the next 10 years. So for the Southern San Andreas, there's been a drumbeat of stories, some of them coming from scientists saying overdue, 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 and that stretch of the fault has been overdue now for going on 100 years. So, and then one more example uh, you may have heard about in the Bay Area, the Hayward Fault. We also have a pretty impressive chronology of past earthquakes for that, past earthquakes that are known for that fault. And this is work by Jim, Jim Leen Camper and his colleagues. There's 12 earthquakes that have been identified 
uh, looking back at geologic strata and seeing where sediments were offset. Um, so an earthquake comes up, breaks the fault, then more sediments come in, the next earthquake breaks up through those sediments and so forth, so you can build up this chronology. And so you can look at that. This is plotting the dates versus the number of earthquakes. And you can see they look pretty regular, right? So you just have to put a line through those points and say when the, know when the next one's going to be, which sounds pretty straightforward. It looks like a pretty regular record. And people have been talking about the Hayward Fault being overdue. Um, it turns out if you, so we know the date of the 1868 earthquake, the last big earthquake, but all the other dates are uncertain to at least 30 years plus or minus. So it turns out if you take the last five earthquakes and put a line through them, you forecast the next one might be sometime around 2008, which, oh, by the way, was over a decade ago, so here we are at overdue. But if you put a line through the past nine earthquakes, then the next earthquake isn't forecast till 2056. And if you put a line through all, all 12 that we know about, the, the sort of nominal forecast date is all the way out at 2096. So all of a sudden, you know, it's not looking quite so overdue. In, ge in geologic terms, the difference between 2008 and 2096 is not huge. It's going to happen sooner or later. Um, but we don't know when it's due, so we can't say it's, it's overdue. So um, by the same token, um, earthquakes are not babies. They don't have due dates. We, they are fairly regular in some places, but there's an awful lot of slop. Uh, they don't happen by clockwork. Um, and so this word overdue is, in my opinion, very much overused. Um, and, and so I would say this one is busted. The bad news is that earthquakes aren't obliged to follow the laws of averages. So it's been 300 years since the last magnitude 9. That doesn't mean the next one's going to be 300 years from now. It could happen, a 9 could happen tomorrow on the Pacific Northwest, and 8 could happen tomorrow on the southern San Andreas. So we can't say it's overdue, but we also can't ever say that an earthquake will not happen. And that's sort of the bottom, the bottom line. So um, the rest of the bad news is that California, the earthquake hazard was debated uh, for a while early in California history. And then the 1933 Long Beach earthquake pretty much put an end to that debate. And so California has had building codes and at least basic seismic provisions going back to 1933 very stringent standards for public school buildings going back to 1933. The Pacific Northwest, the severity of hazard was actively debated and not really understood all the way through the 1980s. And when I was in grad school, which was a while ago, but not quite the Cretaceous, people were debating whether or not you had great earthquakes here. And then the, the evidence built up, again, with work by Brian Atwater, Kenji Sataki, that yes, you have had these great earthquakes, and, and you're going to have them again. Everything that was built here up to, through the 80s was built before people were really aware of, of earthquake hazard. And so the risk up here, um, there is a concern uh, because you do have some of these older buildings that, that predate adequate building codes. Um, also, if that's not bad enough, we, everyone worries about the big one, the magnitude 8 in California, the magnitude 9 here. But if you think back to the earthquakes that we've seen cause damage, um, Loma Prieta, which was 30 years ago yesterday, uh, was a, a 6.9. Uh, Northridge, which was, well, whatever it was, uh, it was a 6.7, but in a densely populated urban area. Uh, the Nisqually earthquake in 2001 was a 6.8. And then the Ridgecrest earthquakes, um, which fortunately were in a fairly remote area, those were a 7.1. So all of these earthquakes were 6.5 to 7. And statistically, in any one lifetime, this is the kind of earthquake you're much more likely to see than this magnitude 9 of lore and legend because those 9s are so infrequent. For every magnitude 9, you're going to have a lot more moderately large earthquakes. And those are the ones that are likely to impact 
any of us where we're living. Um, so this question of when the big one's going to happen and when it's, when it's due or is it overdue, that's kind of beside the point. It's, it's the pretty big earthquakes that we should be worried about, and those are going to be more frequent. So having delivered, oh, okay, so let me go through the list. I, I've given you seven statements, and uh, at least in my view, I would say only one of them is confirmed. The rest of them um, I don't think are well supported. Um, so now that I've, I've given you the bad news, um, the message that I want to leave you with is, is the importance of preparedness, um, because it really can make a huge difference both on a, on a societal level with the building codes and the other steps that are taken, but also on an individual level. There's a lot that you can do as an individual in your home. And you've probably heard some of this before, but are your bookshelves bolted to the wall? Are there things above your bed that could fall if an earthquake happened at night? Do you have emergency food, water, and flashlights to last at least three days, and, and preferably more than that um, if in, an, in any sort of emergency? If you're in your car a lot, do you have an emergency kit in your car, a good pair of shoes, some water, some food? First aid training, overwhelmingly, when people are rescued in an earthquake, it's not the professional emergency responders. Most people are rescued by their neighbors. So signing up for first aid training and taking your neighbor with you is, is a pretty good idea. Um, what else? Situational awareness. This is something that you can do just sort of all the time. Maybe you do it um, when you, if you think about the places that you spend your time or places that you go in frequently. You know, just don't obsess over it, but give a little a, a minute or a few seconds of thought to, well, if an earthquake happens, you know, is there a glass chandelier in this ballroom? Do I want to sit on, under that? Or you know, what would I do? Um, where would I go? Um, and so forth. Just to be aware of, of your, um, the places that you spend your time. A family plan. If you're separated from loved ones during the day, cell phones may not work. How are you, how are you going to contact each other? What's, what's the plan? Um, having a designated contact out of the area can be a good idea because you might be able to call out of the area more easily than you can call within the, the, an impacted area. And then regional resilience, this is mostly done by organizations, but if you're part of a school group or a community group, there are steps that you can take to, to improve uh, resilience for uh, outside of the, the home. And so, um, oh yeah, hopefully you've heard the, the the mantra, drop, cover, and hold on. So if you feel strong shaking, the instinct it can be to run, but it's a really bad idea. What you want to do again, instead is drop to the ground. If you can get under a table or desk, do that. But if you can't, just cover, cover your neck, cover your head, and hold on and until the strong shaking stops. And if you can see this picture, this is the reason why it's a really bad idea to run outside. Uh, this was an older building in California in a, a moderate earthquake in the Bay Area in 2014. And even this older building didn't collapse. And the odds of a, of a building actually collapsing um, are relatively low if you have decent quality construction, even if it's not specially engineered. But the fronts of buildings have architectural doodads, they have facades, they may have gargoyles. Those are more vulnerable, and those can come down in an earthquake, and maybe you can see that in this case they all did. So if you try to run outside, you're going to be potentially hit by, by this stuff landing on you. The other thing is that trying to, to walk or run in, an, in strong shaking is dangerous in itself. One of the few injuries in Ridgecrest was a woman who tried to run out. She was on the second story. She fell. She sprained her ankle. She got up. She kept trying to run. She made it outside. She fell again, and she hurt her leg even, even worse. So you don't want to do that. Just drop, cover, and, and hold on. And that, in, at least in places where catastrophic collapse is unlikely, that is the best advice. So what I want to leave you with is not a set of conclusions, but a challenge that you've taken the time to come out here on a Friday night 
um, and learn a little bit more of earthquakes. But what I'd like to ask everyone to do, or at least think about, is to go home and this weekend pick one thing that you can do to uh, prepare a little bit for, for earthquakes or other emergencies. And they, it can be a little thing. One of the good things you can do is find an old pair of shoes, put it under your bed, and leave it there. Because if an earthquake happens at night, you don't want to get out of bed immediately, but you are going to want to get out of bed. It could be pitch dark. There could be glass on the floor. You're going to want shoes on your feet, and they're going to have to be close to the bed. Uh, maybe stock up on, on water. Uh, this guy, a little rubber stopper for your bathtub. So if there's a bad earthquake and bad enough to disrupt water, you won't lose water pressure immediately. Um, it'll be lost as, as, as the as water seeps out of pipes that are cracked. So one of the things you can do after you've checked everything is go put a good stopper in the tub and fill up the, the bathtub with water. And then that's an instant supply of emergency water. You may or may not want to drink it, but you can use, use it to flush your toilet. You can maybe give it to pets or, or, or so forth. Um, emergency food supplies, having those on hand. Uh, Flashlights, they sell rechargeable flashlights that you can plug into the wall. You can get them at any big box store, hardware store, that will charge all the time. And when the power goes off, they turn on automatically. And you don't even need an earthquake. If there's a power outage, you have an emergency lighting system that will light up your house. And then from there, you can go on to bigger things. Like if your hot water heater isn't strapped to the wall, it should be strapped. Um, if you have a home with natural gas, one of the really valuable things you can do is get a little gizmo that will shut the gas off automatically um, if, a, if a strong enough earthquake happens. And one of the biggest hazards or risks uh, in a big earthquake is fire um, from broken natural gas lines. So that's a little more, that takes a little more of an investment, but it, it would be really, money really well spent. So yeah, if you pick you know, you don't have to do everything, but pick one thing and get that done. And then maybe next weekend, if you're on a roll, pick something else and, you know, keep going until you run out of things. Um, because if you're going to live in California or the Western states, Oregon or Washington, sooner or later, there's a pretty good chance that the earth is going to move for you. It's the price we all pay for living in paradise. And... These steps that you can take within your own home, they really can make a huge difference for your safety and the safety of your loved ones. So with that, I will thank you again for, for coming out and thank the sponsors again. And I think I have time to answer a few questions. Anybody have a question? Going once. So how about that earthquake weather? So, um, earthquake weather. Can, can you comment on the difference between the, the commercial buildings, taller buildings, and how uh, typical wood-framed residential buildings yep. to respond to earthquakes? Yeah, so a, t a, a reasonably well-built wood frame building is pretty safe in an earthquake, especially if it's bolted to the foundation. Um, if, it, if it's older construction and has cripple walls, it can fall off, a house can fall off the cripple wall. So you really need to retrofit those. Um, if it has a brick chimney, those are vulnerable. So the house itself may be okay, the chimney can kind of crash through and, and do quite a bit of, of damage. But a wood frame house is unlikely to collapse. A commercial building, depending on how it's built, if it's unreinforced masonry, it's definitely more vulnerable. Uh, reinforced masonry should be better. Um, it really depends. Steel frame should be quite good, especially if it's newer. Um, is is there any truth to the what we've heard and read that if there is a full Cascadia subduction event, that the coastal area would drop six feet? I don't That's think my house can handle that. Yeah, so things, um, 
when you have subduction, the, the plate's trying to move, but it's locked up. So what happens is strain builds up is that you get parts of the coast are going up. And then when the earthquake happens, it lurches and parts can go down. So it's complicated. Some parts can actually go up, but some areas can go down. And we know we've had like submerged forests. These ghost forests are where you know, big tracks of trees ended up submerged. Um, so depending on where you are, it's possible. Um, yeah, I'm not, I've, I've never looked at earthquakes here, and so exactly which, which areas are, are predicted to move by how much, I'm not sure, but that, that is a, it is a possibility yeah. up there. E easy one is the trees at sunset from 1,200 years ago, Nesquin, all of down in Bandon, Bandon Marsh, they weren't in the inner tidal, and they've been rising since then. So it's like piano keys a little bit. Any other questions? I know that, <laughs> oh, I'll take one more and then we'll go to the lobby. Thank you. Um, I know that the Oregon, Southern Washington, Northern California. Oh. Um, yeah. Are the tremors kind of slow slip and are they relieving some of the stress in this area and the reason we don't have uh, recent earthquakes. Yeah, so um, some of you may have seen this. This is just in the last 10 to 20 years, scientists have realized that you have a lot, this, so you have a subduction zone, the plate's trying to sink, it's locked, but then as you go down deeper, you don't have a locked plate boundary anymore. And it turns out there is this sort of chatter of tremor that's kind of like a lot of really little earthquakes close together that's going down, that's going on that's kind of at the, the down dip edge of where the fault is locked. And then you have these slow slip events. So what we're, we're really getting a, a picture of the whole subduction zone is locked here. Below that, things are moving more steadily. And then you get this, this tremor. But it's not, the tremor and the slow slip is happening deeper. So you've got the, the locked part. That's, that's stuck, it can't move, that, and you, you're not getting tremor for the most part there. So you're definitely building up strain. And as Ron said, you can see the signature of the strain that some areas are being bowed up, and you can see that with GPS. Um, and then they're gonna, so that strain has to be released. The tremor isn't really helping with that, unfortunately. So I would like to thank a couple folks like to start with our IT staff oh, for yeah. getting things back up and, and going tonight, because better late than never for sure, and you can always count on technical difficulties in my life, I know. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight, and definitely Iris SSA. We've got a lot of sponsors here, but Iris and SSA have teamed up in order to send folks around, uh, cover all of their travel expenses, which helps me be able to bring in folks and make it free for all of you. Those of you who have contributed to the tip jar, much appreciated because that just goes to keep bringing people in. So hopefully we'll see some of you tomorrow night, hopefully on Friday, November 8th for the next earthquake talk and into the future. If you haven't picked up some of the sheets that have all of the talks for the year, please go ahead, take some of those with you. And if you got any place to post some posters, please feel free to take them. There's some big ones and some little ones both. And most importantly, thank all of you for coming out tonight as well. I appreciate it greatly. Enjoy the rest of your evening. and your weekend, and I'm sure that Susan would be happy to answer some additional questions out in the lobby, and we're gonna move her to the lobby so that Dallas and crew can get out of here. At